This is Dr. Jeannie Schul with Active Imagination and Creativity. We're going to be talking about the concept of active imagination. And it was Carl Jung who developed this process during the years that he was writing the Black Books, where he created the Red Book, and he was in a personal struggle with his unconscious. These were the years 1913 through 1916. In this time, he was exploring the images that arose from his unconscious, and he found that they led to his own healing. He considered this his self-experimentation, feeling strongly, I could not expect of my patients something I did not dare to do myself. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung asserts, I hit upon the stream of lava and the heat of its fires reshaped my life. Jung went through a large number of iterations until he came upon the term active imagination. Some of these included the transcendent function, dialectical method, the picture method, the technique of differentiation, the technique of introversion, the technique of descent. He also considered the idea of active fantasy, active fantasizing, introspection, trancing, visioning, exercises, until he finally settled into the idea that this needed to be called active imagination. He offered this term in 1935 in London at a lecture. He also published his first paper on active imagination entitled The Transcendent Function in 1916, but was really reticent to, to publish it until 1958, just a couple years before his death. Jung's self-named self-experimentation involved drawing and painting the images he saw in his dreams and the figures and settings he experienced in his active imagination explorations. And this image, of course, is from the Red Book. While Jung was engaged in his self-experimentation, he came up with various methods to deepen into this process. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he shares, it was during Advent of the year 1913, December 12th to be exact, that I resolved upon the decisive step. I was sitting at my desk once more, thinking over my fears. Then I let myself drop. Suddenly, it was as though the ground literally gave way beneath my feet, and I plunged down into dark depths. I could not fend off a feeling of panic. But then, abruptly, at not too great a depth, I landed on my feet in a soft, sticky mass. I felt great relief, although I was apparently in complete darkness. Another method that Jung suggests is, as he reports, in order to seize hold of the fantasies, I frequently imagined a steep descent. I even made several attempts to get to the very bottom. The first time I reached, as it were, a depth of about a thousand feet. The next time I found myself at the edge of a cosmic abyss. It was like a voyage to the moon or a descent into empty space. He talks the reader through this process of active imagination by telling us, choose a dream or some other fantasy image 
and concentrate on it by simply catching hold of it and looking at it. You can also use a bad mood as a starting point and then try to find out what sort of fantasy image it will produce or what image expresses this mood. You then fix this image in the mind by concentrating your attention. Usually it will alter as the mere fact of contemplating it animates it. This image was painted by one of Jung's patients, as he refers to case 16 as she explored her dreams and active imagination and was recommended um, by Jung to put it into uh, visual art. Jung offers another way to guide the reader toward the state of being necessary to experience the unconscious. Take the unconscious in one of its handiest forms, say a spontaneous fantasy, a dream, an irrational mood, an affect, or something of the kind, and operate with it. Give it your special attention, concentrate on it, and observe its alterations objectively. Spare no effort to devote yourself to this task. Follow the subsequent transformations of the spontaneous fantasy attentively and carefully. Above all, don't let anything from outside that does not belong get into it, for the fantasy image has everything it needs. And here, Jung is cautioning us not to go off on free association, which is a frame of reference that Sigmund Freud used. Instead, he wants us to to stay with the image, and this is certainly something that James Hillman also recommended. For Jung, the benefit of active imagination is to distinguish ourselves from the unconscious content. So we, we're not identifying with our fantasies or our dream images. And while he made himself vulnerable to the impulses of the unconscious and the stream of fantasy material that ensued, he remained self-reflective and consciously allowed the process to proceed. That's very different than feeling like you're being possessed by the unconscious. Jung tells us that the years when I pursued my inner images were the most important of my life. In them, everything essential was decided. It all began then. The later details, only supplements and clarifications of the material that burst forth from the unconscious, and at first swamped me. It was the prima materia for a lifetime's work. So it was through his dreams and active imagination that Jung felt all of his later books and theories and philosophies unfolded. Another image of the woman, K-16, created in her work with Jung. These are to be found in Zurich um, in the C.G. Jung archives. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung addresses the power of the image. The images of the unconscious place a great responsibility upon man. Failure to understand them or a shirking of ethical responsibility deprives him of his wholeness and imposes a painful fragmentariness on his life. Robert Johnson, in his book, Inner Works, offers this cautionary statement. Before starting active imagination, 
be sure that there is someone available for you to go to or call in case you become overwhelmed by the imagination and cannot cut it off. This may sound um, a bit dramatic, but because we are dealing with the unconscious, having, having a way to contain it is important. And the idea of having a witness is usually recommended with any form of dream work. As I was creating a nightmare dance, um, using the idea of dark man of the psyche from um, Clarissa Piccola Estes' work, uh, Women Who Run With Wolves, my dancers began to have a psychoactive response to my nightmares. And this is one of the images that they created using their own nightmare material. So working with these really powerful dreams can have and be a great resource for our creativity, whatever form that takes. For Jung, of course, his anchor was his family and his profession. He tells us, particularly at this time, when I was working on the fantasies, I needed a point of support in this world. And I may say that my family and my professional work were that for me. It was most essential for me to have a normal life in the real world as a counterpoise to that strange inner world. My family and my profession remained the base to which I could always return, assuring me that I was an actually existing ordinary person. So this again, having a frame of reference and, and witnesses can help anchor us. Jung told Barbara Hanna, the unconscious itself was not dangerous. There was only one real danger, he said, but that was a very serious one, panic. The fear that grips a person when something very unexpected confronts him or when he begins to be afraid of losing his footing in the conscious world. And this, of course, was reported um, just previously in a slide where he said his initial response was to feel panic. Betrachten. This German word um, means to make something pregnant by giving it your attention. So as Jung explains, looking psychologically brings about the activation of the object. It's as if something were emanating from one's spiritual eye that evokes or activates the object of one's vision. So it is this process of betrachten that enables active imagination when you give the image your undivided attention. As Jung explains it, the English word to look at does not convey this meaning, but the German word betrachten, which is an equivalent, means also to make pregnant that something is due to come out of it. It's alive, it produces, it multiplies. That is the case with any fantasy image. One concentrates upon it and then finds that one has great difficulty in keeping the thing quiet. It gets restless, it shifts, something is added or it multiplies itself. One fills it with living power and it becomes pregnant. Of course, active imagination can take many forms. When Jung writes about active imagination, he seems to describe it from many overlapping perspectives. Sometimes he names the expressive medium, body movement, 
painting, drawing, sculpting, weaving, writing. Sometimes he uses words like dramatic, dialectic, or ritual, as if to describe a typology of the senses. Visual types may expect to see fantasy pictures. Audio-verbal types tend to hear an inner voice. Those with a motor imagination can take a mandala or other motif and make it into a beautiful dance. So when we consider play, fantasy, and the imagination, Jung tells us every good idea and all creative work are the offspring of the imagination. Not the artist alone, but every creative individual whatsoever owes all that is greatest in his life to fantasy. The dynamic principle of fantasy is play, a characteristic also of the child, and as such it appears inconsistent with the principle of serious work. But without this playing with fantasy, no creative work has ever yet come to birth. The debt we owe to play of the imagination is incalculable. As Jung asserts, the modern artist, after all, seeks to create art out of the unconscious. Another image created out of active imagination of one of Jung's patients. As Jung tells us, the unconscious takes the lead nightly in our dreams. So it is not at all surprising that it should usher in the creative process with all sorts of spontaneous phenomena. For Jung, the role of his dreams in his creative process is highly significant. He states, for years my dreams used to anticipate my creative activities. And Marie-Louise von Franz, one of Jung's contemporaries, tells us that one of the most wicked destructive forces, psychologically speaking, is unused creative power. If someone has a creative gift and out of laziness or for some other reason doesn't use it, the psychic energy turns to sheer poison. That's why we often diagnose neuroses and psychotic diseases as not lived higher possibilities. Marie-Louise von Franz shares that Jung once told her symbolic enactment with the body is more effective than ordinary act of imagination, but he could not say why. In the dream dance that became my dissertation, this barrel was the central image and the most overwhelming nightmare. And therefore, um, it held the center stage throughout the dance, which was a 15 minute piece, while transforming from a prison into an altar. And just as the men transformed from antagonists into soulmates, the barrel was reimagined as a place of sacred connection. And the dance was entitled Out of the Nightmare into the Light. With this idea of doing something concrete with your dreams, Robert Johnson refers to Tony Wolf as a holy terror. He tells us she met her patients at the door and before they could even get to the chair, she would demand, what did you do about that dream from last week? Patients who had done something specific, something concrete and physical, were safe from the wrath to come. 
but if they hemmed and hawed and said they thought about it a little, had talked with somebody about it, or some such vague thing, she would turn them around and steer them back through the door. As the door was slamming behind them, she would say, come back when you mean business. That was the way it was with her, and everyone knew it. You either worked or you fled. So Tony Wolf's idea was that dreams exist in modern people too much as airy thoughts, too much as abstractions in the head. One has to notify the rest of one's body that one has dreamed. She said people can analyze for 20 years and nothing below, below the neck is aware that anything is going on. You have to do something about it. Do something with your muscles. And of course, Jung was very involved with Tony Wolf for most of his adult life. And Joan Chopero tells us that Tony Wolf was really um, the first dance therapist as she demonstrates, as is demonstrated by her analysis and Tina Keller. When I was in analysis with Miss Tony Wolf, I often had the feeling that something in me hidden deep inside wanted to express itself. But I also knew that this something had no words. As we were looking for another means of expression, I suddenly had the idea I could dance it. Miss Wolf encouraged me to try. The body sensation I felt was oppression. The image came that I was inside a stone and had to release myself from it to emerge as a separate self, standing individual. The movements that grew out of the body sensations had the goal of my liberation from the stone, just as the image had. I took a good deal of the hour. After a painful effort, I stood there, liberated. This very freeing event was much more potent than the hours in which we only talked. This was a psychodrama of an inner happening, or that which Jung had named active imagination. Only here it was the body that took the active part. Jung's stages of active imagination were in two parts. The first aspect was letting the unconscious come up. He tells us at first the unconscious takes the lead, while the conscious ego serves as a kind of attentive inner witness and perhaps scribe or recorder. The task is to gain access to the contents of the unconscious, which he often suggested that we have our journal or sit at the computer and just write out the dialogue as it unfolds. Then the second aspect is coming to terms with the unconscious. So in the second part of active imagination, consciousness takes the lead. For Jung, the second stage is the more important part because it involves questions of meaning and moral demands. We're told that um, Robert Johnson, as a, a young man working with Jung, received this advice. Spend most of your time alone. Have a separate room to be used for nothing but inner work. Never join any organization or collectivity. And Johnson tells us, Dr. Jung told me that the unconscious would protect me, give me everything I needed for my life, and that my only duty was to do my inner work. All else would follow from this. He said that it was not in the least important whether I accomplished anything outwardly in this life, since my one task was to contribute to the evolution 
of the collective unconscious. Johnson offers his definition of active imagination as a dialogue you enter into with the different parts of yourself that live in the unconscious. The main purpose of this art is to provide communication between the ego and the parts of the unconscious that we usually are usually cut off from. It sets one off on a path toward wholeness toward an awareness of one's larger totality, simply because one has learned to enter into communication with the inner self. So from here, we're hearing Robert Johnson's take and understanding of Jung's active imagination. Johnson insists, once you have found the image and started the inner dialogue, you must relinquish control. Once the invitation is made and the image appears, you can't dictate the focus of your imagination and you can't push it in any particular direction. Johnson's four steps involve invite the unconscious, dialogue and experience, add the ethical elements of values, make it concrete with physical ritual. As we invite the unconscious, Johnson tells us perhaps the purest form of active imagination is that in which you simply clear your mind, go to your imagination, and wait to see who will appear. The first step in active imagination is to invite the creatures of the unconscious to come up to the surface and make contact with us. We invite the inner persons to start a dialogue. Once you've found the image and started the inner dialogue, you must relinquish control. Once the invitation is made and the image appears, you can't dictate the focus of your imagination and you can't push it in any particular direction. So it's about allowing. In the second step of dialogue, making a dialogue is mostly a matter of giving yourself over to the imagination and letting it flow. But moving the experience ahead consists more than anything else in letting the inner figures have a life of their own. The basic attitude you want to show is a willingness to listen to these inner characters. This is certainly the process that Jung experienced with Philemon, and we can explore this in more depth in the Red Book. So, according to Johnson, active imagination starts out from a completely different idea about the unconscious. We affirm that the unconscious has its own wisdom, its own viewpoints, and that they are often as balanced, as realistic as those of the ego mind. The purpose of active imagination is not to program the unconscious, but to listen to the unconscious. And if you do listen, the unconscious in turn will listen to you. In step three, we listen into values. Johnson tells us, first you add the ethical elements by holding out for the attitudes and conduct that are consistent with your character and your deepest values. Second, ethical balance requires that we not let one archetype or one part of ourselves take over at the expense of the others. We can't sacrifice essential values in order to pursue one narrow urge or goal. Third, we must nurture and preserve 
the specifically human values that serve human life, that keep practical daily life going, and that keep our human relations alive. Sand play is one way of doing active imagination. And as Jung explains, a few people work through their active imagination in special modes. They may express their inner imagery through dance, by playing music, drawing, painting, sculpting, or speaking the dialogue out loud. <laughs> then he goes on to tell on himself, I once had a patient who was a dancer, and she could only express the events and dialogues in her imagination by dancing them. The first time she did that, it actually scared me speechless. She was acting out all the rawness, all the beauty, drama, struggle, and tragedy that went on in her inner life. All through her dance, she danced each character, acted out each role, portrayed animals, growled, grunted, shouted, fought, wept. By the time her session was over, I was crouched down, trying to hide in my chair. She said cheerfully, Okay, Robert, you can come out now. This is the Cretan snake goddess that I choreographed in when last I, when last I dreamed, and it was a main stage uh, production at Berry College. So, I also have found that dance is a fabulous way for me to explore my dreams. As Jung explains, to the extent that I manage to translate the emotions into images, that is to say to find the images which were concealed in the emotions, I was inwardly calmed and reassured. Had I left those images hidden in the emotions, I might have been torn to pieces by them. As a result of my experiment, I learned how helpful it can be, from a therapeutic point of view, to find the particular images which lie beneath the emotions. So active imagination works with our images from our dreams, our nightmares, our active imagination. But it's through the images and our creative, expressive way of working with them that we too can find healing. Both images from Jung's Red Book and these are the references that I quoted throughout this sharing. Thank you for joining me.